hi, uh, people of the world, I guess, <laughs> YouTube or whatever. Um, welcome to the Bobby Yaga Project YouTube channel. Um, we have already made a couple of videos, um, that we were really excited to make. Um, and also if you listen to our podcast, then you know that we're coming to the end of our second season. Um, so with all of these sort of like beginnings and endings and what have you happening, we decided it was time that we take a moment to sit back and sort of reflect on what our larger goals with the project are and what we want the sort of themes moving forward to be. So one of the things that we have decided is really important to us is to make sure that the uh, the the themes, the larger theme of both the podcast and all of these videos are really well integrated. We want them to sort of reflect reflect each other and speak to each other and that we're sort of working toward the a similar methodology and idea um movement or whatever uh, across the whole project. So if you've been following the podcast at all, um, or if you've, you know, found our video and gone back to the podcast or whatever, um, you know that our first season focused on the ritualized year. So what did, uh, what did holidays and um, seasonality look like as you moved through the years, sort of throughout history, and how has that changed? Um, for the second season, we've talked about the quote-unquote ritualized life, so um, what kind of formalized life stages existed throughout throughout history, and how did people, you know, sort of like think about the process of growing and aging? So for the third season, um, and sort of for the project going forward, and that's where we come to what we're doing here today, um, we want to sort of focus the rest of the project on community, how people have constructed community, constructed communal identities, and um, built up that community identity uh, in relation to both in between like individuals and between those individuals and the larger environment, so both natural world and sort of our constructed built environment. How has that operated throughout time and how has it changed? So our the big theme that we have going forward is community to commodity. So we want to examine the major societal changes that have happened really starting with the Middle Ages and moving through and like gaining a lot of traction and pace through the period of colonization that have really shaped the way that we interact with our environment and the way that we interact with each other and how that has sort of developed into the relational ideas that we have for today. Um, we, we want to look at how our interactions with our surroundings and often with other people have gone from systems of community building and um, like communal resource management to a system of commodification and extraction. Um, and most importantly, we want to examine we want to examine these changes, how they happened over the course of like these know, almost thousand years now uh, and look at if there are lessons that we can take from the past. Um, we want to look at how we have lived before um, to see if there is a way within that to help us imagine a better future. Um, yeah, <laughs> essentially, that's what we want to do. So like, how can, how can looking at the past help us look toward a, a brighter, better future? What are the lessons of the past? So obviously like not let's go back to the past, but what, how can a, how can the future be better than it is right now? Are there things that we used to know um, that can be adapted to a modern life? So that brings us to this video. What up? Finally getting to the point. Um, we in North America and also the people of Europe are experiencing a um, a real estate and housing crisis. And like, I think for a lot of people, it would seem at a cursory glance that private property and these conceptions that we have about private property have 
are really just like such a foundational piece of our society. It really, it's how we interact with land, with our homes, with all of these sort of foundational ideas about how society and money and anything really works. Um, but how long has this concept really existed and how long has it existed in the way that it's functioning now? Did we always think of land and its use and ownership in this way and uh like when for how long for how long have we done this <laughs> essentially and we think that the answer for a lot of people who aren't historians or possibly even if they are uh depending on what they study um it, it might be surprising um and we might be able to learn a little bit so thanks for taking this journey with us So the, uh, the way that I'm going to do this video, this is going to be a quick and dirty rundown of how people have constructed ideas about property and landscape since the medieval and early modern period. So like we do on the podcast, we're going to start in Europe, but um, for this video, we're going to bounce sort of back and forth. So what did property and landscape look like to a pre-modern person in Europe? That's this section. So if you, dear viewer, have a background knowledge of medieval Europe, you're probably familiar with the term feudal system. Um, but the way that we learn about it in, you know, sort of like secondary school or whatever, um, it is much more sort of complicated and nuanced than the understanding that I think a lot of people have about said feudal, feudal system. So under the feudal system, a lord or whatever their title might be, would have, scare quotes, owned a certain amount of land. Um, essentially, that means there was a, a certain amount of land that he held authority over. Um, and he also held authority over the people who lived and worked that land. Uh, and this sounds like really simple and um, reminiscent of the relationship in our contemporary lives that uses similar terminology. So this is the landlord-tenant relationship. Um, but this feudal landlord-tenant relationship was much more complicated and reciprocal than one might think, you know, from first blush. So while the tenants lived on land that they did not own, and were responsible for working said land and paying rents on said land uh, to the Lord. The Lord also had certain responsibilities to those who lived on that land, right? The Lord was responsible for providing security to all of the tenants. And this meant um, a couple different things. So namely, it was protecting the land and the tenants from outside forces, um, namely forces of violence. Um... And this, this also meant, though, uh, providing security for all of the people who lived on the land, essentially ensuring that they were provided for throughout the entirety of their lives, right? So essentially everyone sh who lived on that Lord's land should have a roof and enough food to get by, right? Basic survival needs should be met. The Lord is responsible for ensuring that, Um Obviously, this is outside of the context of an act of God, like a famine or something, right? If there is no food, the land, the Lord is not necessarily, but that is a, a very specific situation. Um, so the Lord was also, though, responsible for providing the feast on feast days and on holidays, um, which amounted in this period to a significant portion of the calendar. There are some really great videos out there there on YouTube now about the amount of work that uh, medieval peasants actually did and the number of days that they got off, just whole cloth off, um, which is like really cool. And you should check those out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's a major portion of the calendar. He's responsible for providing sort of like feast and or holidays. Um, and he would also be responsible for administering justice and overseeing the sale of land held by gentry within his domain. Um, now, don't misunderstand me as some sort of medieval landlord apologist. Um, this was a very hierarchical situation, and it was like not 
ideal. I'm not saying that we should like go back to the feudal system. No. Um, but the lords did not have a lot of the powers that we think of modern landlords as having the power to do. Um, they were in, in a lot of ways sort of at the mercy of their tenants. Um, the, the tenants, there were a lot more of them for one thing than there were the single Lord of that land. Um, and the cultural conventions of the time would have supported them if, um, as a way to manage their grievances, they decided to just sort of like invade the manor and demand that their needs were met. This was not like a wholly uncommon situation. Um, and actually a lot of the holidays uh, were essentially this. The reveling holidays were essentially made up of tenants bursting into the manor and demanding to be fed and given drink and served by the household. Um, so that there were cultural conventions for that. And the Lord did not have absolute power of the land or the tenants um, simply because he like quote unquote owned it. Because like the ownership here again is something sort of very vague. It's more of an authoritary, uh, an author it's more of an authority over the land. He was responsible for the land and every person that lived on it and was expected to be a sort of like biblical steward of the land. Um, so we're not looking at a type of ownership that is like a contemporary company owning a bunch of land and extracting its resources. Um, in fact, extraction is not really a part of the system at all. Um, and that's for a few reasons. So from the perspective of a lord who held domain over this parcel of land, um, he profited from the parcels that he directly oversaw, um, which would be passed on to his heirs. So it didn't make much sense uh, for a lord to do something like clear cut a forest or strip mine a bunch of hills um, as then you couldn't just pick up and leave and go and buy land somewhere else. This was your like hereditary domain granted to you by uh, whatever, you know, l greater authority there was a king or whatever of that area. Um, so Right, you, there was a certain level of protection that a lord would want to have over the resources that are on, especially his particular parcels of land that he is uh, managing the work of for his profit. Um, and there was also the issue of the commons, which were overseen and administered by the lord, but available for use by everyone. Um, so, so, like, what does this mean? Um, essentially, the Lord was held in check by a sort of environmental use law um, or resource use conventions, essentially. Um, there were restrictions on what would be tolerated for the Lord to take from the woods, fields, from the tenants themselves, etc., as well as a sort of biblical ideology that man was uh, created to steward and care for the land. So that's part of this. Um, but also there's a central part of this system that is the commons. Um, and the commons are the land on which anyone could graze animals or hunt or forage or fish. Um, so it would be a, a large portion of the land that a lord would administer and again was sort of available to everyone for whatever use they might need it for. If you took a high school history class in North America, um, you've probably heard about this historical concept called the tragedy of the commons. And what I want you to do with that idea right now is to take it from your mind um, and get rid of it and never ever think about it ever again. Anything you learned in relation to the tragedy of the commons, um, because it's not real. It didn't happen. Um, there's no evidence that essentially the tragedy of commons is that there was common land that everybody could use. And so, uh, everybody just used that land and then kept theirs in like pristine working order and didn't use it. And 
that destroyed the land that was held in common. But there's literally no evidence that um, f everyone for hundreds of years just overran common land and then used theirs in these perfectly managed ways. Common land and its management was uh, the main way that the lord or nobility was the lord or like nobility of that land was able to ensure that all of the people on the land were provided for. So earlier I said, right, that one of the responsibilities of a lord was to ensure that everyone was cared for for the entirety of their lives, right? Um, the common land ensured that even if you didn't have personal property, right, a parcel of land that you owned within the domain of this lord, um, but was farmed for personal use and used for the building and maintaining of your personal home, you could still have a cottage of some sort with enough land to grow a little vegetable garden, um, some grain from the fields that everyone worked together, um, and the rights to hunt, fish, forage, and collect wood um, and graze any animals you might have had, right? So this essentially, like, gets you up to bare subsistence farming levels by just having the use of the commons. So with this ability to use the common land in this way, and also the, the fact that this opened up the ability for the very poorest of the poor to hire out their labor, um, to those with like larger amounts of private of personal property, um, to they could hire out their labor to work for wages, um, or you know to people who had a trade or something like that. Um, they could do that for a few years in order to establish themselves. This was generally done by um, young people who uh, needed to work for a few years in order to get um, enough money to have a proper setup to be able to afford to marry. But it is important to note that, right, if some rogue guy did decide to take out too much wood or fish or a poach in the lands that had been set aside to sort of replenish the, the stock of animals or whatever someone might be looking for in the woods, um, there, they could be punished in the courts and they could be punished quite seriously. This is one of the, like, biggest issues of, uh, law that's going on in this period. Um, so sort of everyone was held to the standards of these quote unquote, to use like very contemporary language, these like use laws. Um, and so the whole idea of the tragedy of the commons is just a little absurd and ahistorical. So now we get to bump over to North America, see what's going on in pre-modern or really like in terms of actual lining up years, um, pre-colonial period, the, the pre-colonial period, what's going on? Um, so I am going to speak specifically about Eastern North America, um, sort of like from the coast to the Mississippi. Um, but a lot of what I'm saying here is true about communities out West. Um, also before I say anything about, uh, pre-colonial North America, I do want to say that um, there was a system of land ownership. Um, and it's not in the way that we think about land ownership now, just like uh, the way that we think about land ownership now didn't exist in pre-modern Europe. So um, there was a system of owning land. There was the conception that uh, certain people had rights to land and other people did not have rights to that land. Um, so just before we get too far down this road, um, the whole idea that like ah, indigenous people just like didn't have an understanding of land and that's why a lot of the things that happened in the colonial pe period happened no, there's, it's much more insidious than that, actually. Um, so yeah, let's get rolling. Um, oh, also a, uh, quick note, I'm going to be using the term, uh, nation to refer to essentially, um, coherent, uh, communities spoke the same, uh, language and had sort of like similar, uh, governing systems and might be like closely related in terms of governing. But again, this is going to be different than our conception of a nation state. It's just the closest word that we have in English. So that's my language note. I do it in essentially everything. So if we don't need it, whatever. So right, membership in a community or nation, uh, 
and the diplomacy that people had to handle between said communities or nations was sort of done uh, based on a system of family structures, very extended family structures. And most of these communities were to some level matriarchal, meaning that they tracked their uh, sort of family ties through the line of their mother. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about that in a minute, um, but we have to make very clear uh, that these family ties didn't necessarily just refer to the people um, that you might be related to, right? Um, because the nation was held together by these familial ties, uh, the conception of the space in which you lived and that family that you were part of so the, the, the family that was the nation, this very extended concept of a family, also included, um, you know, plants and animals that might be in the same sort of uh, environment as you. So if you are living in a sort of communal way with the plants and animals that surround you, those plants and animals are both considered part of your family and part of the nation that you might be representing or, you know, participating in some sort of governing action with. Um, this, I think, is where we get, uh, you know, when we translate things from indigenous languages to English or when people are talking about indigenous concepts, um, in English uh, we get phrases like brother bear or beaver or whatever, um, how they, there is a familial relationship between right, the family of men, of, of humans, and the family of beaver, otter, salmon, what have you. With this ideology set up, established, right, that your, your nation is a very extended family and that that extended family includes all of the plants and animals that you might be interacting with, this means that when making... Um, decisions about land use or uh, where people are going to be living or moving around or moving through, um, those decisions have to include consideration for the well-being of all of the members of that family, not just the human members. Um, so that's sort of an ideology ideological framework for how these indigenous nations thought about what we would now consider resource management. It wasn't resource management so much as um, how can we meet the needs of everyone in this larger familial community. <laughs> so now, the, right, the crux of this video is really um, how are people negotiating using the land in this period and in these societies um, and for the most part, these were systems of communal landholding on a village basis. Um, so within a village, there would be family homes, right? Um, and often, especially up in the north, like where I live now, um, these were sort of communal or extended family dwellings. Um, in the Haudenosaunee lands, which is where I am filming this video, um, these would have been the longhouses um, on in Algonquin territories, it uh, was um, I think referred to as a, a wigwam or um, it's also in Lenape. Um, this this essentially the setup varied. It might be a sort of parental and child living in some sort of like family home structure. Um, it could be a whole long extended family uh, in one sort of like structure. Um, and the way that those structures were built varied, right? In the same way that they vary across every other continent. Um, so in these systems though, the family home belonged to essentially, <laughs> or was overseen by the senior woman uh, that was dwelling in that home. Um, so, and this would be like a mother or a grandmother, um, sort of depending on how many family generations were living communally in that structure, right? So, uh, if you were a, a husband, husbands would join the families of their wives and move into the homes of said wife, and they would bring their personal property, um, which 
at this period usually amounted to clothing, tools, you know, hunting weapons, what have you, those sort of things, any sentimental items that you might have. And you would bring them into your wife's home. And then if you decided to dissolve the marriage for whatever reason, which you were free to do at any point in time, um, there wasn't a legal process for dissolving a marriage at this point in time, um, you were free, to, you just, you took that stuff and you went back to wherever you came from, essentially. Uh, you could not take the children, the children were the property, no, the children stayed with their uh, mother uh, because it was a matriarchal society, right? So yeah, so then sort of moving out from the actual like family building structure uh, into the rest of the village, um, how were, was land divided up, right? We talked about in Europe, we had the feudal system, so you would have had your cottage, the uh, land that you raised your plants on whatever your your crops and your animals on and then you would have commons and the land for the lord sort of that's how it's divided up um how would the land in um indigenous north america be divided up so um the central part of the village um not really the literal center but um the sort of like foundational part of the uh of the village would be the land that was set up to be used for agriculture. Um, and agriculture was overseen by women. Uh, in Haudenosaunee and Lenape societies, each married woman would receive a parcel of land on which she would um, grow the food that would support her family, right? So herself and her children and husband. Um, and she would be in charge of all of that food, including all of the food that was brought into her home by her husband from hunting. Um, however, the land uh, was worked in common, right? So everybody sort of worked everyone's parcel. And if one parcel did not fare well for whatever reason, right? I don't know, it had like poor drainage or bugs or something, um, then that family would be supported by the production from all of those other parcels. Um, because everybody had worked each parcel, um, if there was a crisis, uh, you had a sort of like communal right, right? And then sort of outside of this space, so you have the agricultural space, you have the sort of like central living part of the village, um, and then you would have the um, uncleared forest. So outside of this space, right, you would have the, the agricultural land, the sort of village center, uh, where you did the actual living space stuff. Um, and then sort of surrounding all of that, you would have the uncleared forest. Um, and this is where the village would collect fuel sources, um, and in which the men would hunt and fish. And we'll get into that in a minute. So wood and fuel would be gathered by women and children who so wood and fuel would be gathered by women and children who were learning the responsibilities of village life in the woods surrounding the village. Um, and the central sort of rule here is that wood could only be gathered within a certain like walkable distance from the village. Um, and when it became difficult to easily access, to easily access uh, fuel, within this walkable, like, sort of radius or perimeter, um, the village would have to move. So this was, like, a really simple way to manage that, that resource of wood and fuel. And this would happen, um, in the Northeast roughly every, uh, 10 to 15 years. So villages sort of, like, moved around every 10 to 15 years, and they'd move in roughly a sort of, like, 20 kilometer uh, space from where they were before. And then outside of this fuel gathering space would be the hunting lands of the community. And right, uh, the relationship to hunting that people in North America had was different from hunting in, uh, in Europe. So Europe had <laughs> large domesticated animals, which um, you could raise on your land and property um, that you could also use as a source of food. Um, those kinds of animals did not exist um, 
sort of until they were brought over there had been like really large animals um but they were not domesticated uh there's very specific requirements for domestication so they just weren't native to this continent um so hunting uh was a significant portion the meat from hunting um and the other like resources that you can get from hunting animals was an important part of the indigenous diet um, still is an important part of the indigenous diet. Um, and this is really the reasoning for the division of labor that happens in these villages. Hunting is a very time and skill intensive activity, um, as is agriculture. So this society really needed both. And, um, so you have that sort of specialization and division of labor. Um, so now that we're sort of outside of the sort of the land that is used every day, how were these lands sort of navigated and understood? Um, these communities or nations or what have you were um, tied to each other through these extended family relationships, but these relationships were also used for negotiating the uh, um, community and national borders or boundaries uh, of like what the nation is. That didn't make any fucking sense. Okay, so we've started sort of in the home, right? And we've now moved out to agricultural lands and then further out into where do you get fuel and then now further out into hunting spaces. So now we're getting up to where we might be sort of bumping up against like borders or boundaries to lands. How were these negotiated and understood? So we talked about the family relationships that were really important in understanding how your community is formed. Um, but these relationships were also important in understanding where your nation uh, sort of begins and ends, where we might be drawing boundaries both in the land and also in communities, right? Um, so these family ties in some way did like cross national boundaries and that was how people really negotiated diplomacy and uh, negotiated borders. So so right now in our world as we understand it now we have these conceptions of nation states and nation states have these hard drawn borders that um, unless like a war happens or something really dramatic these are the borders and they do not change. Um, this was not the conception of land boundaries in the pre-colonial indigenous society. They were, um, one, more than likely, these boundaries would um, sort of run along uh, landscape borders anyway. So along a certain set of hills or a river might be a boundary, um, that sort of thing, like what was part of the landscape, or they might be negotiated because of the territory of certain animals that you might be hunting or, you know, need for whatever people need animals for. Um, but the other thing was that they would m move and change depending on, um, the diplomatic situation that you might have with your neighbors. So land ownership and um, who controlled a certain piece of land was sort of constantly under negotiation and people were moving and resettling and uh, the understanding of what the purpose of land was for, right, what, what we used land for um, would change. So, right, in conclusion of sort of like how did this property management work in indigenous North America was that it was kind of constantly under negotiation. The land that you might be working or living on would be sort of conceived of as communal property um, and the boundaries of what is your community re-nation, uh, what those boundaries were would be in constant negotiation with the neighbors, um, the communities and neighbors that sort of surrounded your property. So that's that. Um, and before we really move on to like what happens, right? Uh, how do we get to the state that we're in now? I want to make this really clear. I don't want to fall into um, anybody thinking that uh, that 
indigenous society was some like mythical magical place where everyone was perfectly in tune with nature and just like you know understood what the plants and animals needed perfectly that fallacy um indigenous people were people much like anywhere in the world the the way that they're managing their resources is really coming from specific cultural ideologies um and but they had a history they have a history and that is something that existed before uh, Europeans showed up. It is a th thousands of years long uh, history. And um, those societies and ideologies changed throughout the course of that. Um, there were sometimes, sometimes these boundaries that I was talking about were negotiated through warfare. Um, and there was a system of slavery before uh, the Atlantic slave trade, right? There was a, in indigenous people in North America had a system of slave had a system of slavery. It was really really different, um, but it did exist. There were you know nations, you know rose to power in their region and then fell from power. Um, the 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 complex wild world of history existed in North America before. European people showed up and I think that it is um, incredibly disingenuous to talk about any sort of indigenous history that doesn't involve acknowledging the fact that like these were changing societies that were changing and evolving and growing and whatever in the same way that societies were on any other continent. So just want to say that and then we can move on to what happened because of colonialism, which is very different from the, the history that was happening before. Right? Okay. Um, but yeah, on a fundamental level, personal property did not really extend outside of the walls of one's home or resources. Um, but on a fundamental level, in North America, pre-colonialism, um, personal property didn't really extend outside of the bounds of one's personal home dwelling space, um, and resources were, for the most part, managed collectively. So, there's that. So, how did we get to our current system of extraction and exploitation when we started out with these two systems of relative communal land use? Um, and the answer we're going to argue here at the Bobby Yaga Project starts with the Black Death. Uh, we're very topical and uh, we want to talk about plagues and how they destabilize stuff. So like, yeah, this is in light of recent events and Le Panini um, and the sort of destabilization that that has wrought in our society over the past like two and a half, three years, however long this has been going on, um, you know, yeah, the plagues are destabilizing. So, um, the Black Death was essentially a cataclysmic event in the history of Europe, um, and eventually in the history of the world. Um, so over the course of four years, um, in the late 1300s, um, the bubonic plague or black plague or black death killed, um, either directly or indirectly about a third of the population of Europe. Um, and it arrived sort of at the at the same time as a series of really, really poor growing seasons. They were extremely wet and cold, which is not great for wheat. So there was also a famine um, on top of the famine that was going to happen from mass amounts of people dying and not being able to work the land. So as a result, um, it, there was famine, there was plague, it was generally a bad time, and in societal terms, losing a third of your population is essentially an apocalyptic event, and it was certainly certainly conceived of that way in Europe at the time. Um, you can look at all of the artwork, music, everything was sort of about, like, you're gonna die! Uh, that's where you get, like, the skeletons that are dancing and chasing people and stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a bad time, um... And essentially the structure of society couldn't really hold after losing so many people, especially the number of people that you lost from um, 
like working people and serfs. So um, to be really short and reductionist about it, the result of this plague is that in many places, um, peasants and serfs start to negotiate their situation um, and like to stand up for their rights and well-being. Um, they basically they basically show up to the manors, the manor houses, to the lords houses, and be like, I do not want to be you know, in the places where there were actual serfs, they were like, I don't want to be tied to the land anymore. Um, I want to keep a higher percentage of what I grow. I want to be able to go to take stuff to the market whenever I want to. I want, if I'm working for wages from you, I want higher wages. You know, all of these things, like I want a better life. And in a lot of places, especially in Eastern Europe, they win a lot of these rights. Like, they're really successful because there's just, like, none of them left to work the land. And the, the lords and, you know, manor holders are, are desperate. Um, and so it's immediately following the Black Death, uh, in a lot of places, uh, the life gets better. I mean, aside from, like, everybody having died around them. Uh, in a sort of like resource way and thinking about how much food you might have or you know how much money you get to keep in your pocket um, life does get better for the very poorest of society um, right the feminines they're able to keep more of what they grow and then purchase more and live more comfortably over a longer period of time yes yeah, so um uh however however um, this was not just all like higher prices and happy peasants who had just survived an apocalypse. Um, there were other serious major changes that had been taking place in this early medieval period. Um, essentially, uh, societies and trade that had really broken down after the fall of the Roman Empire were started, were being rebuilt. Um, and this is, uh, especially true for like, England, who was once again starting to, you know, really export to the continent again. Um, this is really true, uh, especially for England, where they were able to export um, specifically wool, but also other things. Um, export wool back to the continent for a pretty penny, if you will. Um, and the, the lords were seeing that this was happening and they were starting to get ideas, which is just never a good thing. You don't ever want the fancy rich people to start getting ideas. No ideas for fancy rich people. Um, so instead of like bending to the will of the masses, as uh, had happened in other places, um, when when the peasants showed up and were like, we need, you know, better rights and we need to keep more of what we grow and, you know, we want X, Y, and Z, the lords were like, hmm, wait a second. This here is theoretically my land, right? And you're coming to me and asking me for me things when I am letting you live on my land and I'm letting you live, I'm letting you use all of these resources that, you know, are held in common. Why, why am I even doing that? Why am I letting these very, very poor people who aren't giving me anything for the use of my land? Why am I letting them do that? So they start to kick the peasants off the land and enclose the commons. Um, this is a period known very cleverly as, this is a period known very cleverly as the enclosures. Um, because they're literally, <laughs> they're literally building fences around the common lands and being like, you can't be on here anymore. And they're enclosing the land. Um, and essentially what they do is, right, yeah, they build these fences, they enclose the land, and they start just grazing sheep on there. They're like, this, it's not worth it for me, for all of these peasants to take this piece of land and grow a bunch of wheat that they're just going to keep for themselves. It doesn't make any sense for me to let them hunt all of these deer. These are my deer, you know, whatever. So they, they put up all of these fences, they graze a bunch of sheep, they shear the sheep, they send the wool to the continent, and they make a butt ton of money off of it. 
Um, and that wool then is sold solely for the profit of the landlords. And so what we have is over the course of the period of the enclosures is the incre creation of a property type that is not, um, it's not for personal maintenance of a household um, or for the common use of a larger population. It is for the explicit profit of one landowner, which is radically outsized um, by his personal need. So over the course of the period of enclosures, what we have is a creation of a property type that is not for the maintenance of a personal household and not for the common use of a larger po population, but solely for the proper solely for the profit of one landholder um, and he is profiting at a rate that is so far outside of what his personal need is right and with this property he is able then to make more money and buy more lands and become wealthier and it all becomes this gross sort of centralization of wealth and power into a very small very particular class and so then we have the question, right, what happens to all of the peasants who had relied on this land and relied on the Lord for survival and this formally reciprocal relationship uh, when this, this system broke down? Like, what happens when they start fencing everything in and the very poorest of the poor people who didn't actually own any of the land over which the Lord had authority, what happens to them, to the people who are surviving off of the commons? So what happened to the peasants who had relied on this land and relied on this reciprocal relationship? What happens when the landlords um, crack down and kick them off of the commons and decide, like, we're not doing common land anymore? Um, essentially, they were they become functionally homeless. And this is really the first time that we see this kind of thing in Europe. Okay. So being without shelter because of a specific financial situation was not really a part of European society in any meaningful way um, until this point. And what we see is a rush of peasants from the countryside, from these places where they had been able to use the common land, um, fleeing, essentially, yeah, really fleeing to uh, cities and urban environments um, where they become the itinerant poor um, that plague cities essentially and those concerned with social welfare um for the rest of uh history like really up until now like that is where the creation of this very urban poor itinerant poor people who do not have homes or shelters because they cannot af afford them um that's where this really develops in europe so now I'm at this sort of like transitional place here, right, in this video. Um, so we have, um, we have private property now, right? Private property is property that is not used for your personal maintenance and is not common lands that perhaps some person, one person oversees the management and like legal management of. Um, and we have this private property, which is another tool through which the wealthy could become wealthier and wield more power. We also have a whole series of sort of like political and religious crises um, that really lead to the development of what becomes the nation state. Um, and we, uh, I can't get, <laughs> it's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. Um, the Protestant Reformation is involved. Like, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, and we'll probably definitely talk about the creation of the nation state in a later video, um, but I can't get into it really right now. What we need to know is that the, the, uh, what we need to know is that the nation state, uh, really comes into its own in the 15th and 16th centuries and that a central, it's a, a central part of the development of this concept, this idea of a state state that has a national identity, um, a foundational part of that is that they're fighting with each other um, and trying to gain control over as much land as possible. Um, and that really gets us to transatlantic colonial efforts. Um, so for uh, my purpose, for our purposes here, for our purposes here, I'm going to talk about British North America um, and the creation of 
right? British North America and the United States. And just because this process looks sort of different in uh, like French North America and how long that actually lasts, and then um, very different in Spanish North America. And if anything in Spanish North America, it's even more brutal than uh, what we talk about with like the sort of founding societies of what become the United States. So, the history of colonization in North America. Very cheerful. You're going to love it. It's going to be... No, it's terrible. Uh, it's long and complicated, and I'm going to simplify a lot of what happens now um, for the purposes of e expediency, essentially. Um, and uh, essentially just to get to what is uh, important and special about the way that private property develops and is used in... Uh, the New Republic, which is the period uh, in right after the founding of the United States. So uh, the basic rundown of col colonization in uh, what becomes British North America, right? Um, essentially, it's Europeans show up um, from a, a bunch of different places, but also just uh, for various reasons, either they're associated again with a nation state or with a particular religious movement. And essentially they start fighting with themselves um, for control over certain areas. Um, you know, this is either, you know, England and France fighting over control of certain areas uh, or just people sort of just fighting. They're just like, nah, up in arms about stuff. Um, but before they even really start making serious inroads into establishing colonies or really even establishing settlements, um, they bring their diseases and the diseases start to spread uh, unbelievably quickly through indigenous societies. Um, and right, we said before that the Black Death caused the death of about a third of the population and that it was apocalyptic. Um, what happens in North America, I think, for any modern person is really just, I don't think that there's a way to really comprehend what happens because of these quote unquote virgin soil epidemics. Um, the European diseases literally decimate indigenous nations. One in 10 people survive. Right, so that's nine people out of every ten die of one of these diseases um, over the course of a couple of decades. Um, oftentimes, the, these diseases are showing up, you know, miles and miles outside of where uh, any Europeans even are. Uh, they, for example, um, in Cherokee, the diseases associate the European diseases show up a full generation before. Uh, Europeans make contact with the Cherokee Nation. So there's that. Um, it's unimaginable horror. Uh, and then, uh, and, and, and really, like, I mean, there are whole uh, nations, community settlements that are completely wiped out. Uh, there's a story in Cherokee about a particular town where um, there religious leader had a a vision that trouble was coming to the community and so he opened up a hole in the earth that went to um another safer place um and uh it's sort of understood to be a, a spirit world um and he all of the the settlement jumped into this hole um and you can and uh, the, the people who were telling the story to uh, newly arrived Europeans were saying, like, trust me, it happened. You can go there and see the town. And, like, the European person who, like, recounted this um, story did go there. And it literally was just, like, this sort of ghost town where it looked like uh, everybody had just sort of, like, walked up and left all of their stuff um, and disappeared. And the the explanation really is that that entire settlement got smallpox or measles or something and, and died. Um, yeah. So it's just like, it's, it's super awful. And, and that, you know, if we talk about how, 
uh, Europe struggled to maintain any semblance of its former society uh, after the Black Death, like, this is a super destabilizing situation um, for all of the nations in North America. Um, so into this super destabilized society uh, comes for our purpose here the, the British or the English. Um, and on they show up on the coast of Virginia and Massachusetts, and there aren't really people there. Um, you know, there's there's some small populations, uh, some small communities, but for the most part, the people who had made up the nations and communities that lived directly on the coast had moved inward to sort of stronger, uh, larger settlements more inland for protection in the face of again, the destabilization that was happening because of these epidemics. Um, so the English who are showing up, um, especially those the Puritans who showed up in Massachusetts, are convinced that uh, the land had been quote-unquote cleared for their settlement. They, uh, the Puritans especially were trying to set up this like new religious order, um, and they saw it as a sign from God that they were meant to have this land. Um, so they, um, they start setting the, the English start setting up settlements, um, villages and stuff, uh, and they, they get their little towns built and then they get these charters from, you know, depending on the time that they're showing up and setting up these towns, they get charters from either the king or queen that say that they, uh, own the land, um, and they just sort of move on with their mission of colonization. Um, eventually, they do end up getting into armed conflicts with indigenous people, and that causes a whole other set of issues that we'll probably talk about in later videos. Um, but essentially, as the colonies start to sh take shape, the issue for indigenous people becomes, um, like, as the colonies really, like, become colonies, the issue becomes these uh, settlers or squatters that are kind of to the west, like, moving ever westward from these initial towns and cities on the coast. Um, these are these are colonists who have, have left these initial town cities or even, like, the sort of secondary auxiliary towns and cities um, because they want more land or they they don't have any money to ha support themselves within the towns, um, so they're, they're going out to seek land that they can farm. Um, yeah, so there's all of these squatters and stuff uh, out in there, and that's going to become important in just a minute. So, we've got... Right, these new colonies, all this stuff. We're getting right up to the the late 18th century. In come the events of the American War for Independence. So up to this point, the colonists have been using and thinking about land in a very British slash European way, but specifically a very British way. Um, and essentially, this is you had a claim to these this land if you were working it, um, if you were you were. Uh, using it or or bettering it there's a lot of different words that they use for it but essentially um if you were productively growing something on it in a way that was understood by european farming practices and this was the justification that they used for seizing land from indigenous people because to european eyes who were used to this very structured way of growing individual crops next to each other um the indigenous people were not using a majority of the land that they held um so yeah that was the justification in a lot of times for uh the, the seizure of this land. But we, we get, we sort of roll through the American War for Independence or the Revolutionary War, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the new government of the United States has a problem. Um, and that problem is that uh, the Continental Army had promised... Um, payment essentially for services rendered right to soldiers to 
to generals, to anybody who was serving with the Continental Army, um, and those who were helping to support it. They they had promised all of this this money, wages essentially, and payment for goods and services, um, and, but they didn't have any money. And during the war, they had been pr printing this like continental money. It was worthless. They had nothing to back it up. Um, they didn't have any resources, and they certainly didn't have gold or silver. Um, and like that is a huge problem. Like, well, you're just going to default on all of these debts and sort of throw a major a, a good portion of your citizens into destitution. Like that is just a recipe for another armed conflict. Um, so in the face of this staggering debt and in the need to pay their veterans and to pay, uh, you know, other individuals who had, you know, rendered services or whatever, um, they turned to the one thing that they did have, uh, at least in the eyes of this new government and Europeans, um, and that was a lot of land, uh, which in their minds they owned and it was functionally unpopulated. Um, so according to the charters of the colonies, uh, that were granted by said king or queen, uh, depending on what period they were actually written, um, the, uh, the charters usually extended from the coastline, uh, the eastern coastline, all the way across to wherever the land ended, right? The continent ended. It was just like drawn sort of like a parallel. Um, you can look, this is explicit in the Georgia charter, uh, for example. So, uh, legally in the eyes of the European or these new American courts, the United States government owned all of this land and they decided that they would do something that would change the way that real estate was used and even thought about. They used it to pay these debts. <sighs> yeah. So they used it to pay these debts and that might not seem like a big deal, um, but it does set up the way that Americans use property um, and change the way that Americans use property and then the way that the American banking system is set up and then the way that uh, the U.S. sort of moves out and influences the rest of the world. Um, this is all really important to that. Um, so we talked about before how under feudalism, people were buying and selling land, but that land was considered owned because it was in use, right? There was a knowledge of what it could produce. Um, the land itself wasn't the resource so much as the wheat or the sheep or whatever was produced upon it, along with the people who lived there. You know, certain serfs uh, were also considered part of that property, depending on where you were in Europe. Um, this essentially, this mo this pain of debts uh, with this property and or um, at some point in time just uh, creating money or financial resources based on the potential of this land is essentially the U.S. government speculating on land, right? The potential of the land was the value. It could be exchanged for cash or for other land. Um... And for the first time, land was being used essentially as a fungible asset. Um, people could back investments with this land. Um, and it was not, it wasn't necessarily like being used or worked. Um, it was land that theoretically could have had zero extractive or productive value other than that it could hold up a building. Um, and this is where we have the development of the real estate market, right? The idea that just having land is valuable and that uh, the value of, of money, of, of anything that like having and or taking away land that you might not even be using um, is in itself like a currency. So from here, the U.S. banking system has developed and the weird eccentricities that have become part of the global market has developed. Um, and this is where the idea that real estate as a way to produce, produce profits uh, really comes to shape our world as we know it now. So land changed from a personal or communal property um, that is managed by either an individual, you know, for the sake of a collective or managed by a community. Um, 
to an appointed landlord to a to private property to something owned by some sort of entity for the purpose of extracting monetary value so that's really this is the course of the shift that we see um, from this feudal system or in north america this collective resource management to private property for extractive purposes, to private property for the sake of private property itself, just for speculation. Um, and of course, like, right, obviously value and extractive properties are part of that land value. But like the way that we think about real estate now is like, oh, well, no matter what, real estate is a good investment. That comes from this period here. So I don't want to just drop off now and be like, well, this is how it is now, and we just have to live with it. Uh, we live in a, a system of extraction and commodification, and that sucks. And it sucks that you'll you if you're a millennial like me, uh, you might not ever own your own home or have any sort of like financial security like that. Uh, the really. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Don't want to do it. Uh, the The point of this whole video and project is to point out that things have, have been done differently in the past, and we can do things differently in the future, right? Obviously, the past of pre-modern periods were not great. The Black Plague uh, is... <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously uh, the the past, especially the pre-modern societies, uh, those periods were not great. Um, the Black Death is one example of how things can really have sucked. Um, and pre-contact America definitely had its own um, issues. Like I said before, you know, there was the violence and fighting for regional power and all sorts of stuff. Um, I am not suggesting that uh, we should just, like, try and recreate some perfect, like, you know, imagined pastoral past. Like, we should recreate that. That is not the vibe we're going for here. What, uh, what, what we are trying to do is to look at this process and ask how did it happen and why. And we want to point out that this is a major cultural shift, right? Um... As we go through this project, we're going to see this kind of movement happen with so many different kinds of resources, with so many different ways that we interact with both each other and our environment. And we want to really examine how that happens, why it happens, why we're moving from these systems of communal ownership, from these systems of community, to these systems of commodity, uh, to these systems of extraction. So the, the conversation of colonialism also includes this cultural destruction and reconstruction that's been inflicted on indigenous societies as well um, to force them into a process of commodification along with all of these other places that have been affected by European colonialism. And we're going to be going through and looking at how that has happened as well, right? So how did these cultural shifts happen in Europe and how has colonialism really forced them onto these other regions as well? So, but if we understand how this process happened, then it's no longer just the way things are. Um, real estate and property, your home does not need to just be a commodity. We can rebuild community. We can recreate systems of commons. The resources that we hold in common probably won't be the same as they were in the Middle Ages, and they're probably not going to be things like a, you know, circumference of wood gathering land uh but we can build these like communal resource management systems right um and we can do it with so many other things if we understand our history and if we work together um what I'm really getting at is that I hope that you liked this video, um, and I really hope that you follow along with the rest of the project. If you want a more in-depth look at what I talked about here, um, about this process from this community to pr this communal land use to private property, we have a very long <laughs> podcast episode about it. I believe it's... Um, it's just episode three of season one. So if you haven't listened to the podcast at all, you should just check it out and you'll get to it really quick. Um, it's on the Babiaga Project website. It's also anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Um, we will be back here 
regularly with videos um, about community, folklore, and our shared relationship with the world around us. And it, coming back in May, we'll be here with season three of the pod. Um, on this channel, we're also going to have uh, monthly videos where we talk about how historians do historical work um, and how we do historical research so that if you uh, don't have any experience with it, you can learn how to dive even deeper than maybe we're going into on the pod or here into these historical questions if you are interested in them. We really want to make this um, a place where you can come to learn these skills so you can explore it as deeply as you want to into history. Um, and we really hope that you do all of this. We really hope that you, uh, you come along on this journey with us, that you dive as deep into history as you possibly can, um, and that you maybe come up with the answers that we have yet not been able to. Um, so yeah, if, if you like this video, like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon. Thanks.